All right. Um, no special camera movement or anything this week, I guess, because I have um, I have a bunch of stuff to do, including apologizing to my wife. Why? I really have no idea. I guess she does, but she won't tell me because that's how women are, which, you know, relationship advice, just do it. Just go and apologize. Okay. And I'm going to do it. Um, and also, it seems like this camera, looking at it, it, it basically portrays me nothing like what I actually look like in real life. So there's really only upsides to filming from my laptop, it seems. But that aside, this week, um, I guess I'll say a few words about Kazan and Prom's 2023, uh, 2022 operational results, whether they can swamp or want to swamp the market with cheap pounds or not. Um, you might have likely already picked up on this yourself. I also talked to Luke Tenhava about some of the news from the junior space and, um, and, and generally about how he deals with these moments where almost everything looks almost too cheap, right? But it might be cheap for a reason, especially in the junior space. So there's that. Um, oh yeah, I have some personal news, I guess, to share. I'm giving Discord another try. So I've um, I've created the resource talks server now. Uh, and if you're not on Discord and you have no idea what I'm saying, I've basically created a community chat for people who hate money. So if you do, you can come on there to chat and do a bunch of other things like uh, you can get early access to interviews, um, an almost daily market update. I'm saying almost because I'm afraid of commitment and I'm not going to call it a daily market update. Um, that's likely not worth your time anyways. And then um, there's also even the, uh, you, you get even the chance to send in questions up front for guests that I would have on on here. And over time, there's probably going to be a bunch of other uh, a bunch of other stuff. Um, I made a video explaining more in depth what this chat server is, and I also managed to get it working on the website, by the way. So if you're not on Discord, you can just go on to resourcetalks.com uh, and click on chat in the upper left corner, and then you can participate as a guest in your browser or just read without really participating, which would uh, not be my preferred option, but hey, you do you. Discord app is still much better. You know, if you are on Discord, I'll just have a link, um, a, 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 a Discord invite somewhere in the comments or in the description or whatever. It's it's also it's a free server, so feel free to join. But maybe also give it time before there's any people who who talk on there because um, it's just right now it's just a few bots basically talking into the void. But it might be it might get better if you start talking yourself. Um, all right, that that about does it. Let's not make the intro too long, although it already is. Market overview before we get into the rest. It was actually a good week this week, besides for energy commodities, but I'll get to that, of course. And um, the NASDAQ is up nearly 5% on the weekly. Uh, so a decent move there. The S&P was also up. Um, and that's basically happening as the government cal basically calmed down the public by by practically giving out lifelines to, life to failing banks. Um, I, by the way, talked to Joseph Wong, the ex-Fed guy, about this, and he told me that it was basically overblown and that there is not much to worry about around these bank failures. And he even told me he was buying some stocks. Um, as far as I understood it, he told me he was buying uh, oil and steel stocks, uh, but somebody pointed in the comments that I might have misunderstood it. But yeah, feel free to to do check that out as well. It's, it seems like the general belief um, after this week, though, is that um, especially after the CPI report this week, which came in at six percent, so lower than the previous six point four percent. So the general belief is that during the next week's Fed meeting, the Fed will do only a single rate hike, so a twenty five basis points rate hike. That is, where Europe, for example, this week did a fifty basis points rate hike. So if the Fed only does a single one meaning at 25 basis points, then that would mean the dollar should weaken against the euro. And I guess that should also open a um, a lane for, 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 for commodities uh, and gold in particular to go up. Now, was there to be a pivot, you know, meaning, you know, power goes into to hike or uh, to, to cut, I mean, um, go, goes not to hike or even to, to emergency cut the interest rates? Then all bets are off, I guess, which is which is I have no idea what that means, but people who seem smart say that all the time, and now so do I. What else uh, other smart people seem to talk about is this uh, Treasury yield curve, which this Friday looked pretty much the same as it did last Friday, but only much lower. So as as fear reigns on Wall Street, I guess for some reason people are piling into bonds, and all of the yields are now under five percent. The majority is even under four percent. 
Uh, actually, all of them, all of the yields after the one-year yield are under 4%, but the, the curve is still inverted, though the 10-year seems to be wanting to go back above the five-year, if that means anything. The fear and greed index ticked up a little bit this week. It's now at 25, so it's right at the border between extreme fear and normal fear. You know, kind of like what I experienced when I've been on the toilet with my laptop for 45 minutes and my wife starts walking around the house. Um, but so the market is definitely not bullish on equities yet. That's the point. And a Bank of America study also revealed that investors are racing to cash is what they say. And that cash funds saw the highest inflows since April of 2020. And uh, generally, investors have been cash hungry um this first quarter of 2023 almost as cash hungry as the covid quarter in 2020 so the trade this week was basically um short energy short risk on assets and long cash and bonds and also long gold of course as i'll touch upon later but that bank of america study is probably a good sentiment indicator too because it is it's basically showing that people are are generally bearish in the stock market they're not yet ready to get bullish on equities uh, so that's the stock market. That's equities. Now on to commodities. The worst performing commodities this week were not industrials, not precious metals, and not even soybeans, which if it were up to me, those would be shorted out of existence. But it was energy. Crude oil fell the most. It's down 13% this week. It's now knocking in the door of $65 a barrel, despite OPEC driving um, the uh, trying to drive the price um, by, by raising its demand outlook for China. As uh, data came in this week showing that China processed 3.3% more oil in the first two months of the year in response to increasing travel travel numbers and data and all that, and, and them really stepping off of, of, the, of the COVID madness. For now, they're saying that the oil supply and demand balance, though, is about to get rather tight in the second part of the year. And, and you know, that's combined with the banking turmoil turning out to have been more of a PSYOP than actual systemic risk. With an easing Fed and um and and all that, then they might come out to be right with the oil market getting tighter and potentially oil going higher. But oil this week is as by the way, oil as most things is far out of my depth. But the sentiment on Twitter is also funny to follow uh, after this week because because everybody who was ever just slightly bullish in oil is getting dragged through the mud and negativity is 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 gloating, um, which. In my brief experience and from what I've been told by the experts I, I talk to is is contrarian and then something something contrarian victim, you know, either be contrarian, either be victim, you know what I'm trying to say. Now, coal was also the, the uh, hardly hit. It's the second hardest hit energy commodity this week, falling nearly 4%. It now sits on 173 still a level at which most producers, at least the good ones, seem to still be making good money. So it is... Is it time for the low prices to 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 cure the low prices? Well, China doesn't seem to think that. China is the biggest coal miner and the biggest coal consumer uh, as well, by the way. And so their coal output went up 5.8% in the first two months of the year. And so they're not cutting production despite the quote-unquote low prices because they're not low prices. They're just falling prices. Uh, they also, by the way, removed all of the regulations that they had in place banning imports of Australian coal this week, which is... You know, on one side, it's bullish for the general recovery of the, of the economy as it suggests that they are looking to use more energy. But on the other hand, um, so it's bullish in oil, by the way, as well as bullish industrials, copper and all and so on and so forth. But it, it is, of course, not as bullish for coal, which was already trading far above the marginal cost of production for, for a very long period of time. Um, and it then moved on to humble many of the people that I follow on Twitter by showing them that nobody's really bigger than the market. And eventually... The high prices cure the high prices, and you can't run away from that dynamic. Uh, and that, that's, by the way, on top of the natural gas slump in prices. Uh, natural gas slump in prices, they, they apparently have an effect on coal. As um, Well, see, natural gas prices were down this week. Um, they were down 3.5%. They are once again below 250 and apparently that matters for coal prices too, because when the alternative is so much cheaper than the high prices of the one commodity get cured by the, uh, well, the low prices of the alternative, which is, yeah, in this case, natural gas is the alternative to coal, I guess, in some cases. And natural gas is still getting cheaper, and it doesn't seem like it will stop anytime soon. With production increasing and demand decreasing due to the warmer weather, 
while stockpiles of gas are now at uh, 36% above the five-year average. Talking about production increasing, by the way, uh, I'm not making this up because drillers in the U.S. this week added the most natural gas rigs in a week in over four years. And we now have nearly 15% more gas rigs than the same time last year. Um, we have a total, I mean, when I say we, it's really Americans. Uh, I'm not an American. I just like to believe that I am because I consume so much of their popular culture. Uh, but so Americans now have a total of 754 gas rigs active. With that, U.S. gas production is expected to be higher this year uh, than it was last year and higher still next year than it is expected to be this year. And going into spring now, it doesn't seem like the natural gas price is about to you know, bottom or it, it, it doesn't look like it's about to, to, to get better before it gets any worse. Although, again, looking at the sentiment on Twitter, you think we're very close to the bottom here. Um, and, and we might be because we're not we're not too far off the the the, um, the the production cost, the average production cost for gas. And doesn't I mean, you think this wouldn't be the the, the incentive price for gas, but w with the you know with drillers in the US adding rigs, I guess that's selling a different story. But I also have to remind you that talking to a chimpanzee is much more likely to provide you with good results than listening to a random talking head on the internet, especially if that talking head is um well me. Uranium dipped below $50, uh, below the per gender bottom this week. And uh, I actually asked per gender about it. I, I interviewed him this week. Um, my interview will be posted on, on YouTube next week, but it's already been posted on Discord. I po posted it pretty much immediately. It was available for download. Um, so I guess wink, wink, cough, cough. It's time for you to join that Discord server. But the point is that the global turmoil seems to be dragging the price of uranium down, likely much more as a knee-jerk reaction than actual fundamentals because this the, the, the thesis just keeps improving. I hate to say that because I sound like a permable. I am not. I am very happy to test my thesis. I am very happy to find that there's something wrong with the thesis and, and help out whoever something, whatever it's possible. But it just seems like the thesis gets better and better. And this week, the, the, the thesis kept improving as the biggest news for uranium came out of Kazakhstan, um, Kazanomprom specifically, obviously. Kazanomprom announced their 2022 year uh, end results in which they showed a more than doubling in their net profit, which comes in as a result of the increased price of uranium. Not anything else, because while the profits went uh, the profits went up, they actually sold less uranium in 2022 than they did in 2021. It was about one percent less, not big of a change, but the the, the it was less, um, and the profits doubled. That's because the average realized price was up 31 percent to 42.50 per pound, uh, close to but still under the average spot price last year, which was just uh, shy of 50 bucks. They have an explanation for that. It's basically because the volatility in this uranium spot market. And um, so it's not like, you know, the spot price is 50. They're just forever going to get 50 on. It, it, it's not how it works. Um, but that's basically where the where the, where the the pop in profits is coming from for Kazanoprom. They made uh, roughly $1.4 billion US dollars in EBITDA. Uh, that is on the background of a $7 billion market cap with um, some 300 million US dollars in debt. But also some 400 million US dollars in cash, um, equating to roughly, don't count me in the number, this is back of the envelope, but roughly five for their EV2 EBITDA. And uh, oh, and, and also 0 0.05, so like half of 0 0.1 in the uh, net debt to EBITDA, which means that their dividend will be at least 75% following the, the, the guidance that they've given us previously. So it's going to be. Um, what's well, going to be at least 75% of their free cash flow. And that is likely to amount to some six or so percent. I'm saying or so, and I'm being vague because this is, again, very back of the dirty old envelope math for dummies. But in conclusion, because Anaprom is not an expensive company right now, if I am to trust my um, my math, although I probably shouldn't, uh, and you definitely shouldn't. But what it comes down to is that the political and jurisdictional risk, which might be the same thing actually for the time being they are definitely weighing this thing down and it it, it is it is you know it it, it is not not expensive at the current moment at least in these financial metrics but that doesn't mean it is risk less right 
And uh, yes, it is. It, it's worth noting though that I am I'm using the numbers they provided in their uh, Kazakh currency, the Tenge, and I am converting them to the USD using today's today's Sunday today's exchange rate, which might skew the perspective a little bit, uh, considering the strength of the US dollar over the recent past versus versus their own currency. But it is also worth noting that um, now that I for some reason brought currencies into this just to make my life a little bit more complicated. Because uh, Adam Prom sells its end product in dollars, right? And it also receives funding in 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 dollars. But they make their expenses in the Tenge. That's the Kazakh currency. So um, as they mentioned at the beginning of their report, that basically creates a natural hedge for the currency risk. So yeah, there are risks, but it appears that the currency risk is, is sort of taken care of uh, naturally, automatically. Other important results here, their production went down about 4%, mainly due to supply chain issues in sourcing pipes and acid during uh, 2021, which happened because of the problems that happened in 2020, which slowed production in 2022, because they were trying to get their hands on, on pipes, acid and whatnot for well field development in 2021. And it usually takes roughly 10 months to go from start of the development of a well fuel project to, to the finished goods. So that's why it resulted in, in, in a drop in production in 2022. And I'm going to say something about their production. They're expected, they're, um, they're basically their forecasted production for 2023. Um, their inventory, though, went up about 6%. It's now roughly 20 million pounds. Um, this is basically... Why do even have an inventory is because not everybody wants their uranium delivered on the same moment when they produce it, so they keep it to the side. It's basically there to service contracts. So uh, no, they're not stockpiling it just to swamp the market once it hits sixty dollars. I asked um, when I interviewed one of their insiders. I asked about that as well. Now their all in cash cost was also up about twenty one percent. So that's uh, what a fifth uh, to just over sixteen dollars per pound. Apparently, they took on more production personnel, and uh, of course, their material costs went up because of, as I said, supply chain disruptions, yada, yada, yada. Now, this might come over a little bit as, as, as shocking, you know, as it might make you think that, oh, they could just ramp up production here because of, of how cheaply they, they produce uranium. They just go, you know, stick the pipes in the ground, uranium comes up, it's it's nothing, right? But this, a couple of points, I guess, This this the $16 here is actually not not a realistic number. Um, I am not a big fan of the AISC number of the all-in sustaining cost because this is what they are announcing here is their all-in sustaining cash cost. And um, so this, for example, as far as I understand, it does include a bunch of important costs like financial costs are not included. So interest rate, uh, interest, interest costs and uh, taxes, I believe, are not even included. The cost doesn't account for anybody in the office getting paid either. So it's stuff like that. It's it's not really sixteen bucks at which they are incentivized to go and produce, you know, stick those pipes in the ground and, and pull the uranium out. Now, that said though, don't get me wrong, because Anaprom is definitely one of the, if not even the lowest cost producer in the world. And um I suppose that they would break even in the low twenties now, but that's possibly going to be the high twenties, low thirties next year. That's where where basically the price needs to be for them to not be making a loss. They won't be making good money. They won't be incentivized to ramp up production significantly at those um, potentially, and this is an estimation, $30. Um, they're not going to be keeping shareholders happy if they do that um, because they're not going to be making good money, but they won't be making a loss either, which means it's a very cheap producer, not likely incentivized to swamp the market at, at that 30 bucks that they're, that they are talking, estimating, uh, estimating. And, you know, unlike most of the time, by the way, I'm not making any of that up when I say that their costs next year will be even higher, possibly in the 30s. Uh, this coming from their own guidance as for the all-in sustaining costs for next year. So uh, remember, all-in sustaining costs, not including a bunch of important costs, um, that already surpasses $21. But that also doesn't mean that they will swamp the market at that price. Okay, well, I I'm saying that a lot. Um, well, I guess I should explain that a little bit more. It's probably going to make this video annoying and, and too long, but there's really two things here. Okay. One of those is uh, I'll show you a clip from an old interview that I did with their business development guy, Corey Koss. He's a Canadian who's, he's no longer with the company. Unfortunately, he's alive. I made it sound like he's not alive. Corey, if you're watching this, hi, I know you're very much alive. Uh, but 
back then when he was with the company, I asked him what a Kazana Prom is looking to swamp the market. And he gave me a very good answer. So I'll, I'll play you that clip. That will cover the 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 want part, as in, do they want to swamp the market? But there's also the second one and, and arguably more important part, which is the can part. So um, can Cassandra Prom swamp the market? Well, they spent roughly uh, 150 billion of their own currency in uh, capex last year, which is this is some 330 million dollars, and uh, their production is down four percent after spending that money. And not only their current production, but their outlook for 2023 is also that their production will be down while they expect to spend over $500 million US dollars in CapEx this year. This is like real actual green, you know, Illuminati dollars, not 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 the monopoly stuff. So um, can they? That was the first, the, the second question. I, I heavily doubt that they could ramp up production significantly without some serious funding. And so it's not like somebody gives them a hundred million and they can double production next year. It's just not what they're communicating to us here. I, I, I am definitely open to the potential for me missing something. So please do correct me below. But that's as far as I get it right now. It's not. It, I don't see the chance for them seriously increasing their production uh, without seriously increasing their production expenses too, because they will, you know, they have to pay more for a quicker delivery and so on and so forth. They have to take on more personnel, which is going to ramp up their their costs um, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is also, by the way, the company, what, why the company lowered its uh, 2023 guidance. And um, on the lower end, they expect to produce roughly 3.5% less this year than what they did last year, which was already about 4% lower than what they did the year prior. And uh, then when it comes down to transporting that uranium, by the way, to the end buyer, those costs uh, also rose significantly this year as they're now using the Trans-Caspian route, which so that they don't have to go through Russia. So this this results in higher expenses and it also adds um it adds to their to the, to their final cost. But so even if they could ramp up the price, then there's still the want. And that's that's what I wanted to play the clip. I don't think they they want to, first of all, because they literally told us in this report that they don't want to and they um Actually, I'm going to quote you this. At the beginning of the report, they said, um, I'm going to be reading this, because Anaprom is well positioned to benefit from the improving improving market dynamics and maximize the value for our stakeholders through continued production and sales discipline more than ever. So, that, I mean, that doesn't sound to me like they are looking to go ahead and, you know, triple production all of a sudden, swamp the market, kill their own baby. Um, but... Also, as I mentioned, one of their insiders just literally told me that that's not what they want to do. He pretty much told me what they were saying here, uh, but I, I just I just think he put it a lot more equal, equivalently, eloquently. There it is. Um, yeah. So let me let me show you that segment from my interview with Corey because I'd be talking for too long. However, what, one main concern that I uh, hear when someone brings up because I don't promise when someone really brings up the uranium shortage. Is um is when people would say something like, uh, "Oh well, because Adam Prom has uh you know mothballed pro mothballed production, so when when the spot price is high enough, they will swamp the uranium market on shorter term contracts and uh and crash the price." Mm -hmm. What do you what would you say if someone told you that? Well, I think there's kind of two two main aspects to, to examine in that regard. One being that we are already 40, 45% of, of production coming out of Kazakhstan, 25-ish percent to our account. We're under no disillusion that the world is going to go 100% Kazakh uranium. Um, and so from that perspective, then you look at market share today, we're not looking to shoot out the lights on increased market share. Um, which may sound funny, but when you're as big as we are in this industry, like, you know, small in the context of everything else, but big in our industry, um, that's something we watch carefully. So we're not looking to, you know, significantly grow and increase the, the share that we have currently in the market. Um, the idea that we would come in and swamp things, uh, I mean, that's detrimental to our own bottom line. Uh, we brought this, this strategy in place to, I guess, to attract investors back at the time of the IPO. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't come out there with a, a story of, 
vertical integration or just being the biggest, you know, obviously you need to introduce value. So the value, ex- examine the value of the industry. The most value for the u- nuclear fuel cycle is in the, the very front end mining and within mining, it's within ISR mining and that's, that's our bread and butter. That's our expertise. And so we brought in this, this strategy of reducing by 20%. Now the question has always been why, why 20%? Well, we have a limit within our permits at every one of our, every one of our assets that we can go plus or minus 20% without having to go back to the government. And now this is unlike a lot of jurisdictions where you're getting a permit to produce a maximum amount and you can kind of do whatever you want under that amount. For us, it is a contract with the government to say, we're producing this number of years at each one of these assets. This is how much we will produce. And it gives them line of sight to, you know, federal budgets and things like that. And so we have committed to deliver these pounds and they, they've said, well, with operational issues, uh, the unpredictability of ISR, things that could happen over the 25 plus year duration of these permits, um, we'll give you flex to go higher or lower. And what we did with the strategy is we implemented the full flex down that we could to minus 20% against those commitments to the government. Um, so now we've been operating at that for 2018, 19, 20. We've extended it now through 2023. And now for 2024, the recent announcement is we're going to go to minus 10%, slightly higher. And the reason for doing that is that we have good line of sight that those pounds will wind up in the hands of utilities, customers. Uh, not that we'll you know, get to year end and, oh, we raised production, but now we've got to you know, get rid of it kind of thing or build up a big inventory. We increase this production because we have better line of sight through our long-term contracting that like I said, we haven't been able to do historically, but we can now and have been able to through this contracting cycle. And so those pounds we feel have a, a, a home that they will go to if we slightly increase. Um, if price was to rise significantly, I think that's maybe the, the, the second message is that the rising price isn't what's driving our decision to increase production. If it goes to $90 tomorrow, it has to be fundamentally driven. And we have to see as Kazatomprom the success in our contracting and locking up um, higher prices and higher volumes, because again, we don't want to bring it out of the ground and then just be splashing it in the market and taking us back down to that hit that eighteen dollar price or twenty dollar market. That's what what we saw. I think when we went to the IPO and, and focusing on value was that yeah, sure, we were making money at eighteen dollars, but why is the lowest cost pound in the market setting the price? That makes no sense. Mm. And, and nothing ever follows perfect. Economics, of course, but really it should be the last pound, the the high priced African asset or a U.S. asset or whatever it might be that brings that that cost up. That sorry, the the value of the uranium up based on that cost, and then the bottom quartile enjoys uh, greater profits. That is the strategy that's been put in place, and the focus we we talk about minus twenty percent, but the underlying strategy there is a focus on value. So the idea that we're going to see price rise and that we're just going to tank it. Well, as I said, for one, market share is an issue. We're, we're not fooling ourselves that we're going to grow significantly on that front. And it's only detrimental to our value proposition, which is not just for our investors, but for the Kazakh people. Maximize the value of this asset the country has been blessed with. Hmm. Uh, one last note to be made from that Kazakhstan Prime report is that China was at the top of their customer list. They were buying almost, I am saying almost, Almost twice as much as the second uh, country on this list, which is it's Canada. I assume that's Cameco, so that's what I was going to say. Company. So, the the stigma that somehow the Chinese will also magically, you know, magic up their own pounds of uranium doesn't ring true. And the supply discipline that Kazan Prom is talking about seems to be working for them. And they're now looking to the east as um, you know, selling pounds to the west is not now. Well, it's not not impossible. For sure, it's not impossible. Their 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 trans Caspian route seems to be working, but it is definitely more expensive, and it might start getting more challenging. So they need to keep those doors open. And China is 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 um at the top of their list now. So, but in in summary, I don't think Kazan Prom wants to swamp the market and kill its own baby. And they also, according to what they're communicating to us, they really couldn't do it profitably, even if they wanted to, as their costs are continually rising. Um, both the production expenses and the sustaining capex is rising, transportation costs are rising, and um, therefore they expect to produce less uranium this year um, as they're having issues sourcing stuff like sulfuric acid and pipeline uh, pipes for well field development and stuff like that. And um, oh, and there's also uh, there's changes to the tax code in in Kazakhstan of the, there's a new mineral extraction tax, which also came into effect in early 2023 in Kazakhstan, which will also have an impact on their costs. 
Um, and, and all of this is, is is likely to result in them having to do the opposite of swamping the market with 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 pounds of uranium, which which I guess would be to to continue buying pounds on the spot market as they did in twenty twenty two. Next time we're going to hear from Kazanoprom would be in about a month or so on April twenty eighth. They're expected to release their integrated annual report which is looked at extensively throughout the industry is that's the um that's where they lay out their strategy even more clearly but i guess the numbers are are already speaking to me unlike my wife now cuz Prom is not the only company that will have issues ramping up production again cas is not the only place that will have those supply chain issues or has had those supply chain issues um and, and take, for example, a company in the U.S., Peninsula Energy. They announced this week that they expect production to be delayed to mid-year. Um, still this year, they're expecting it still this year, but it's going to be delayed to this to to mid this year. What it was, um, I, I guess, it was actually they they should have been producing already, but they're having delays uh, right now, citing uh, comparable issues to what Kazana promised citing. And the market obviously didn't like that, and the stock gave back 7.5% this week. But the point is that Palinsel is also experiencing the tightness of the supply chain, if that makes sense. Now, Encore Energy, you might say, oh, it's not everybody in the U.S. You know, Encore Energy is um, announcing restarts and so on and so forth. And yes, the Encore Energy came out this week with some news saying that they still target to restart production from the Alta Mesa Mill in early 2024. So... Sure. Uh, this is also the second planned restart for the company. They're hoping to restart Rosita in 2023 as well. Um, but those are their plans, right? It'll be interesting to see if any supply challenges uh, slow them down as well. They have not yet communicated anything like that, so I'm purely speculating. But, you know, it'll be interesting to watch. The market doesn't seem that that's likely. The market doesn't seem that um, that that uh, Encore will have delays because the stock went up over 9% this week. And I was in the face of the URNM ETF falling 3%. So I guess the general point that I'm trying to make with this very long rant here that nobody's ever listening to anymore is that in the short run, it doesn't seem like following news. Um, um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that in the short run, it doesn't seem like there will be an oversupply of the market. Um I guess you could make the case like if, if uranium spikes and does something like super crazy that there might be production, but it's still not over the short run. Like it's not going to be a six month window that all of a sudden, you know, pounds magically appear uh, and contracts magically get signed and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it'll be it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Other than that, as I said, the spot price fell this week and spot didn't buy any uranium as the fund mostly traded at a discount and a, and a rather big discount too, it was almost 15% at one point. And this, this by the way, I deemed this to be a good sentiment indicator. And uh, the longer the non-buying spree, the lower the sentiment goes. And it, it is now being two weeks since they bought anything under the spot market. But again, um, it, that, I, I think that's a, a good sentiment indicator. And I talked to that, uh, talked to, about that to Per Jander in my interview with him. So um, another plug for the Discord server. But over the short run, it seems like the market is is counting uranium as energy as, a, as just an energy commodity and the underlying equities is risk on assets. While based on what Kazana Prom is saying, based on what the other companies are communicating, uranium is something different. Again, I hate to say this because it sounds perma bullish in the face of falling stock prices, but that that that's what I'm seeing. Again, if I'm missing something, if, if there's something wrong in these things, Please do. This is the only reason I'm putting this out there to, to be correct and to figure out if I'm saying something wrong. So um, please do correct me if I'm saying something wrong. But th despite what I like to believe, the market always wins in the end. OK, despite what me and you like to believe, despite what and everybody, anybody, um, the market can stay irrational far longer than you can stay solvent is true. But it's also true that the market is absolutely positively much smarter than me. So the chance is higher that I'm missing something here. Moving on and away from uranium, because depression is not really my favorite mental place. The uncertainty in, in the global economy is uh, hurting industrial metals too. And uh, tin in particular was down 6% this week. It's one of the worst performing commodities. And it is currently in the process of erasing all of the gains that it made um, throughout the last four or so months in what was allegedly a rebound from the bottom uh, correction to that move up. Might have been a dead cat bounce. Um, but it's, you know, tin is still high on the grand scheme of things. If you zoom out enough years, 
And again, the good producers uh, like Alpha Min, like Malaysia, Smelting, they are ramping up production like it's nobody's business and are making money at these levels still. So it doesn't seem like a supply crunch is expected in tin, but it's a very niche metal. I don't understand it. It is very opaque and uh, a spike in demand might also do the trick of rising the prices. So I will be on the lookout, but can you foresee it? I don't think so. Is it falling because it should be? I guess, as I was saying, the market is smarter than us. So let's assume that it is. On to the best performing commodities of this week, because we had green in the commodity sector this week as per textbook. Um, I don't know if there are any textbooks on the subject, but I, I can barely read myself and I generally fall asleep after five minutes of reading. But the panic caused by the banking sector naturally pushed gold higher. And um, with silver being the more leveraged of the two monetary metals, it went up over 10% this week. It's now above $22. Well, interestingly enough, actually, the SAL ETF, which is supposed to be a lot more leveraged to the silver price than, than silver itself, than physical silver, uh, the SAL ETF is a silver miners ETF was up a little bit less than that. It was up, it was still up 10%, but it was, I would have expected a much bigger move when silver moves up 10% to the, to the upside. And even more interestingly is that the GDX ETF outperformed um, pretty much everything else. It outperformed the SAL ETF, it outperformed the SALJ ETF, it outperformed the GDXJ ETF as well, the so-called juniors ETF. This is not really a juniors ETF in a way that you and I understand it just an ETF with somewhat smaller producers, but it's still producers. But the GDX ETF, it went up 12.5%, while gold only, and it's quote-unquote only, went up 6.5%. So there's that. And I guess I don't, I don't really have anything intelligent to say on, um, on that. Uh, one, because I'm not an intelligent person. And two, because supply and demand fundamentals don't seem to matter too much when it comes down to these monetary metals. So I guess if you're trying to understand those, I can only offer you my condolences and admit to you that I gave up trying to understand why gold and silver move uh, like a long time ago. It must have been two hours ago or something like that. But yeah, gold, as I said, it was the second best performing commodity this week. It's up. It was the second best performing commodity this week. It's up 6.5% and it came down dangerously close, but didn't cross the $2,000 line. Uh, which this two thousand dollar line, if you look at my Twitter feed, you you would understand that this is a very important level. That when you cross it, if you scratch your left toe, which you're right here at the exact moment of crossing that price level, you are highly likely to get a free golden toilet. But I guess that's not the point of investing in gold. Okay, the point of investing in gold is to have a pile of gold coins, and every time you have guests over for dinner, bore them to death by showing how showing them how shiny your stack is, right? Meanwhile, as you're doing that, gold ETFs are still mostly seeing outflows, and uh, February saw a $1.7 billion outflow, making it the 10th consecutive month of ETF outflows for gold. Uh, but for now, yes, the dollar is weakening, so gold is going higher, and it seems like the people who know their physical, they buy low and they sell high. Who would have thought? And I guess your favorite junior shitco is likely to have news on Monday, by the way, just to show you that they're still breeding, just to show you that they've not forget forgotten that despite them having seven properties with seven different metals, allegedly, they don't really have anything. Uh, they're still a gold company. So don't be surprised if, they, if you see a bunch of name changes too from Lithium Explore Co. something something to Gold Explore Co. something something. Be skeptical about it though, but don't be surprised. Other interesting moves were to be found in Lumber. Lumber was up 27% this week uh, as the, I think that was the best performing commodity actually. Uh, I guess this is happening as mortgage rates in the US are falling below 7%. China is showing signs of, of better demand and stuff like that. Eggs are also among the top performing commodities this week. They were up 10.5% as we are nearing Easter. I think it's about in, in like in about three weeks or so. And the bird flu is still not under control. And uh, Dollar Tree, this is an American grocery chain for uranium investors and other people who need to buy cheap food. So that this dollar chain, um, a dollar tree chain has now stopped selling eggs, even though some um, eggs are down some 40%. The, the, yeah, they're 40% lower than the recent peak. And uh, the, the drop in the PPI, the producer price index, is apparently also mainly thanks to the drop in egg prices. So it'll be interesting to see 
how that develops as we again are nearing Easter, which will show how much the high prices managed to cure the high prices or what our eggs are sort of following the women logic, which, you know, that's, that's a spot where high prices are don't, don't necessarily make something less desirable. They actually make it more desirable. Um, what I mean by that is kind of like a designer designer bag, which by the way, as I'm saying this, I'm realizing that I'm probably being sexist or something along those lines because I shouldn't generalize, you know, that, that it's not only women who can carry designer bags these days. Men and everything in between is also allowed to wear, carry, do whatever with designer bags, okay? Just don't, don't cancel me. It is true, though, that the Dutch government issued a statement this week saying that they now... Uh, they're, they're, they've now tested two vaccines. Uh, this sounds almost like a joke, but it's not. They tested a French and a German one. Um, if this was 80 years ago, nobody would have been laughing. But they found that both vaccines both give chickens protection against the virus, as well as they counter the spreading uh, of said virus. So France is currently among the nations vaccinating chickens, which is, I'm not even kidding, okay? This was something... Eventually, uh, apparently, this was considered uh, a taboo back in the day. It's not 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 really a, a thing. Uh, it wasn't really a thing. It is now becoming a thing, though. So they they, they are uh, they're now supposed to be launching a field trial in um, in the Netherlands, I guess, to see whether the vaccines will actually work in real life conditions. And those uh, those trials are said to take more than a year to give a good idea of how long chickens are still immune after vaccination. So is this where? Supply is, is is this is what supply is waiting for to see if the vaccinations are working so that they can vex, vaccinate their new chickens so that they don't bring on supply that is eventually going to end up having to be killed. I, I don't really know, but it, it does make sense, the point that they're making here. And in meanwhile, I'm just hoping that they won't start masking chickens because um, I don't even know why I have to explain to you why that's wrong, but it is wrong. But nothing surprises me in today's world. Um, if the chicken disease isn't enough, by the way, you should also know that swine flu is also back in China. Um, I mean, it, it apparently never left after killing millions of pigs in 2018 and 2019. Um, they're saying it's not as serious now as it was back then, but still, production could drop as much as 10% is what the estimations are. And the weird part of the hog market, though, apparently, is that when when China has to slaughter... when whoever has to slaughter um, hogs at a younger age because of the virus, the price would be falling, actually, not going up because the cost uh, of those younger hogs is just lower. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. But, you know, come time for demand to ramp up again. If there aren't any hogs, then that that's when the price would go up. And by the way, both for poultry and for hogs, um, that the demand would generally pick up in the second part of the year. That's where 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 demand for food generally ramps up. Um, and if that happens, you know, if they if they've already killed their young hogs, sold them for lower prices, then there might be shortage of pigs in China. Um, and then there's absolutely no reason why you should need it to know all that. By the way, I don't know how we got here. I just saw it. I wrote it down. I thought like, hey, let me bring it up. So. I guess this might be a good time to stop going over commodities because eventually I'm going to have gone through all of them and you're going to be bored to death. Um, that is if I'm pretending that there's anybody watching this and not only people who forgot to turn off the laptop. So let's move on to the headline segment. I'm going to go through three headlines that sort of caught my attention. And the first one comes from Bloomberg and it reads, LME rocked by new nickel scandal after finding bags of stones. It pretty much is what it sounds so the LME went looking for physical nickel that was supposed to be the thing that backs their paper contracts, uh, but they found just bags full of regular stones. You know, it was not a huge portion of their contracts. It's a it's a pretty small part, actually, just um, 0.15%, so not 15%, 0.15%. And it's, that, that's just about $1.3 million. That's not a lot in the global lithium, um, in the global nickel trade, forgive me. So there shouldn't be any impact on the price. But the point here is that if the LME cannot be trusted, who can really be trusted with these paper contracts? And uh, it's also interesting that, that it's nickel. I'm going to say something about that. But so far, they don't really know where the nickel went, whether it was ever there, whether it was stolen, what happened to it. Uh, was it intercepted earlier? No, no, nobody really knows. No real explanation about that. Not yet. Interesting. So just be interesting to see what happens if they um if they go to check on their other warehouses and they don't find anything because this one 
is obviously not the only warehouse. This one's in Rotterdam in Holland. And it's not, you know, it's, it's of course not their only warehouse. So it would be interesting to see if they will have any um, problems in the other warehouses and what impact that might have on the nickel market if all of a sudden, you know, a bunch of metal was expected to be present, but it was no longer to be found. What, what effect is that going to have on the nickel market? That's going to be interesting to watch. Um, as I was saying, yeah, it's also interesting that it's nickel because nickel is is also the, the metal that Trafigura had a scandal around. They've also... They've uh, they've allegedly been defrauded, and they are um, they are still looking for the nickel uh, on their contracts. They they are not finding it, and um, this is of course after after the LME had to deal with the with the crisis last year. If you remember, where they they basically canceled billions of dollars in trades because the price went up too much or something, so everybody had to give the money back. That was horrible. Um, but I, I guess no real conclusion there. It's just interesting to see where where this is going to lead. And it, I'm surprised that this happens in 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 today's world. Next on here, uh, on here I have. I'm trying to combine words because I'm uh, falling asleep. But I have a Reuters article that reads: Volkswagen to invest in mines in bid to become a global battery supplier. So Thomas Schmall, who appears to be Volkswagen CEO, is apparently also waking up to the fact that technology is not the only only thing that matters when it comes down to defeating Tesla, which it clearly is his wet dream, and that raw materials is where the issues are likely to be over this and potentially the next decade. And he said, and I am quoting the article here, the bottleneck for raw materials is mining capacity. That's why we need to invest in mines directly. So for once, the title is not made up, and uh, he actually said that. Of course, he said nothing about where or what mines or how he would like to invest in those mines, but this just confirms a lot of the narratives that I've um, sort of read over the last couple of years, and it's it's not only it's not only niche newsletter writers sounding the alarm anymore. It is actual and, and huge businesses, too, who are under very high pressure to make money and stay on top of the innovation game. It, it is those type of businesses that deem such investments crucial. And, and it also tells me that, if anything, I was way too early to this whole commodity complex thing and that I could have focused on a different place, made money, and come back to the commodities and not missed a lot. Um, but if anything, this this is show, this, this just shows that it, it's... A, if there is a big cycle, I'm not... Like, I'm not claiming that there's going to be it looks like if i'm if i'm trusting the people i talk to it looks like it's going to be a big super cycle and 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 if they're right and if that's true if anything that cycle is just about to start this is also among the lines of what zoltan poser told me by the way in that interview uh it's on my channel you can watch that too and if if you're asking for my personal opinion by the way as a beauty expert i think those new volkswagen electric cars are quite ugly uh, even uglier than the teslas which by the way teslas are among the worst looking cars on the road even though they tried ripping off porsche for the looks uh, but they eventually came out looking uh, really something like what i would look if i was a car which is to say misaligned and trying too hard um Another one of the, uh, this is the last one actually, and then I'll leave you alone. The last headline for today also confirms those feelings that I'm having. And this one comes from Moody's and it reads, Moody's changes its global metals and mining outlook to stable on improving business conditions despite persistent risk. Credit fundamentals will not deteriorate, deteriorate. Yeah, I told you I'm falling asleep. Uh, let's try again. Credit for the measures will not deteriorate over our outlook period, but will remain volatile and in certain cases will improve. Business conditions will improve for the global metal and mining industry in the next 12 months, but uncertainties about growth in China and emerging markets are uh, and stubborn inflation pose continued risks for the industry. This is what the article starts. And the main commodities that they were talking about in this article um, in, in this article, uh, were base metals. Uh, so for those, Moody says that, uh, well, nothing new really for most of you, I guess. But they say that demand is growing in a time where, as Volkswagen is finding out, supply of those commodities is not as straightforward and um, inventories are as tight as ever. More specifically, and I'll just continue reading, um, they say that aluminum prices will persist above historical average through early 2024 based on, among other factors, its expanding role in clean energy. 
Copper's historically low inventories and ongoing industry supply disruptions will support its price. This should be nothing new to you, by the way, if you've been following along. Nickel will be in surplus in 2023. Hopefully it's not just stones. But incremental growth in demand from electric vehicle market will create supply deficits while uh, they say on here. And then they continue, while zinc prices will be supported by tight supply and inventories and low inventories and higher energy costs, displacing high cost producers. Prices for iron ore will ease further through at least early to mid 2024 as world supply gains start to outpace demand. But reduced production guidance from iron ore producers in Brazil and Argentina will support prices for at least the first half of 2023. I am almost done reading. Don't kill yourself yet. On the other hand, steelmakers will generate historically strong earnings and cash flow in 2023. But economic growth and steel demand will likely weaken through the year as higher interest rates mute growth in steel consuming. They also mentioned coal, by the way, on here. Um and they are basically they 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 basically confirm my confirmation bias. Say they feed my confirmation bias, saying that that the, the thermal the thermal coal trade is uh, not as obvious anymore to them because um, I guess I'm gonna have to quote again. Uh, prices will exceed historical averages throughout early 2024, but the record prices of 2022 were unsustainable. Interestingly, they also mentioned that while precious metals are likely to generate strong demand, that will also involve high production costs, which is also in line with what other news have um, sort of shown throughout the last couple of weeks where, you know, we, we've been talking about this. But most gold producers are struggling to make money even at these historically high prices. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to these companies, to, these, to, to their stocks, given that they're struggling with these high costs. And um I guess, you know what, if Moody's is waking up to it, there really must be something going on as there is um, there, there is less than zero chance for me to see and understand something that Moody's doesn't. Uh, obviously, they are on the side of caution, so therefore they need more confirmation. And the, the, the tone of voice used in this article suggests that they're not like super excited um, I guess because they obviously said that they, they expect commodities to be stable, not to go to the moon or something like that. So they're not yet uber bullish, but they are waking up to the idea of us needing more commodities and not having those. Um, I guess this will have to do it for the headlines. Uh, actually, not that many because I'll simply ignore the one where literally just 10 drums, 10 barrels, if you want to call them drums, of uranium were or lost, quote unquote. They were just not at the exact location where they had to be in Libya, and everybody freaked out. Every news agency took the chance to make it a big story. Right before, like just literally a few hours later, those drums got found just a couple of miles away. So let's not pretend like it was a big important news, at least for once. And let's talk about what's happening in in the junior space. When I say let's talk about, I mean, let me shut up and let Luke Tunhava from uh, Gold Discovery do the talking. All right, Luke, I'm looking at the list that you send me, and I see that some of the names, like two names doubled. They're not too many big moves, but then overall the sector went up a lot. And then the ones that you send me that went up, like the one that doubled over here that it didn't have any news. Um, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you how do you how do you explain these moves? Yeah, so every week I um, I send you the list with the biggest movers, and in most weeks you see that at least fifty percent of the big movers have some news, and that news then caused the co the company to really spike or really make a big move in that week. And this week uh, I think it was really more sentiment driven. Uh, when I looked at the biggest risers, in some cases you see news like a month ago or a couple of weeks ago, and maybe because the markets were uncertain. And this week was a good week for gold and silver again. People stepped in later. Or in some cases, I mean, Canadian companies are also known for rumors and leaks. And in some cases, you have these very uh, tight share structures and people buying information, buying the stock because they heard something about it. So uh, I cannot really judge about the no news. I mean, every company has its own sort of uh, dynamics. Some of them seem to be moving on a small, a small volume. Some of them without news on big volume. And if you see a company like Vertical 
exploration without any news. Um, pretty decent volume. And there's nothing also not in the last couple of weeks in terms of news that I can see. Then time will tell, I think. Uh, I have no idea why this company started to move. Maybe people that know this company very well and maybe it's it's in a certain jurisdiction and jurisdiction got certainly got better or something, but there was nothing obvious about these movers uh, to talk about today. Hmm. How do you deal with something like that when you, you know, you've, you've, you've maybe watched the company and you, you've watched it getting cheaper and cheaper over time and then all of a sudden it's going up with the overall market? Are you getting FOMO? Are you staying on the sidelines and looking for what's going to happen next? How, how do you deal with that, like mentally? Well, personally, I, I try to follow a, a large number of companies, uh, a large number of companies and then a smaller number of companies really in detail. And it's always diff always difficult to know when a company will turn, but especially companies that have been going down for months and months and months. And at some point, they often flatline. They Sometimes they just turn around and that was it. But it also, in many cases, you see a company, the stock price really flatline. And at that point, the sellers are done. Everybody who wanted to sell us out and there's enough buying to keep the share price at a certain level. And that's the point I, I often want to get in. Um, and, and sometimes it flatlines for a number of weeks or even a number of months. Um, and then you suddenly see that spike. And that spike is not really, that's, that's explainable because the company still has a good team, still has, some, in some cases, cash in the treasury. They still have a good project, but it was just unloved for a number of reasons. Maybe just market sentiment, maybe jurisdiction, maybe expiration news. And that's often when the opportunities come. So sometimes you indeed see a big spike without news, but that's because it has been flatlining for a long time. People, Some people know that the management team is good, project is good, but it's just not in love right now. So then at some, at some point, all the sellers are just gone. The, the buyers have been accumulating and there's no stock left. And then you can suddenly see a stock go up. You can see it double or you know go up 50% on no news. And that's not even weird. I mean, it makes sense because um, if there are people that know the company and they have been accumulating, at some point it's just out of available stock and then it's uh, the price will go up. And that's with, in Canada, all these companies are in general quite illiquid and have pretty good share structures compared to Australia. But sometimes you just see that the share structure in combination of with a couple of good buyers that you, just causes the share price to go up without news. Hmm. What I have and the way is, I do it is I, I want to be in in that flatlining phase. So I try to look for those companies that I that I like, but have no immediate, you know, no, no, no immediate news release or no immediate catalyst. That's the ones that I like because you really have the time to accumulate and wait for that spike to come. Mm -hmm. what, what I have sort of a a problem with is that if I've been watching a company like you're describing now and looking at sort of start flatlining, looking for the, for the sellers to be out the door. Um, when something like this happens, like this week, and the stock, you know, pops like twenty or thirty percent, now all of a sudden I feel like I've already missed out on it, and like, and and that, I don't know. It's just it really is a feeling because when you start thinking about it more deeply, then you realize that it's not a the right way to think about it. But I get this feeling of okay, I've missed out. I should look for something else. Yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, that 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 feeling everybody has. It's just how you how will you deal with that emotion. And it depends a little bit, I think, how much it already moved. Because the easiest way is to get in, and of course now I'm telling something that makes sense to everyone, but to get in really low and in hindsight that you think, okay, I, I almost picked the bottom. Uh, because then it makes it easier to also see the stock down again after a number of weeks if you want to hold it. So I think the most important is you want to know why you're buying it. Are you buying it trade or are you buying it to hold it for a long time? Mm. And I've got a couple of examples with me today. For example, Fosterville South. That company was trading at five dollar at some point. They have a good team. Uh, they are good technically, but also promotionally. I mean, people they know how to raise money, and uh, so if they have something that's valuable, those people often know how to get the value out of that project. Um, so they they started when they had this Newfoundland, oh sorry, this uh, Fosterville area um, sort of staking rush almost, and they got their hands on a good project, and the, and everybody wants to get in. But then the expiration results were not amazing and the stock came down from $5 to $0.30. Cents. And the $0.30 cents 
the company had a market cap of 16 million, it also had working capital, cash in the bank of 16 million. And it can always go a bit lower. It's not impossible. But at that point, knowing that the insiders are buying and, and the CEO is CEO is buying, it's a good CEO, the project is probably pretty good, or maybe they can some, find something new. But a 16 million market cap with 16 million in the bank and a good team that are buying in the market, and probably their friends or their network may also be accumulating. You, you don't know if you pick the bottom, but if but it's okay to pick a, a price around that 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 sort of bottom. And this company kind of doubled within more than doubled within a couple of weeks and then came back down again from 75 cents to I think 40 or something. Hmm. Um, so I think it's it makes sense to not to be in in time if you think you are too late and you really feel like I need the stock to go up to have enough confidence to keep it, then it's probably not worth it. Yeah, you need to have enough confidence in the company and in the story. And that's why it's better to be in in time. But that doesn't have to be the, the, the absolute bottom, but let's say the first around 10, 20% of the bottom. Hmm. If it then really moves without any specific reason, I would not really try to catch it later because then it becomes more difficult. Uh, it, it depends what you want to do. If you, even if you get the bottom at 30 cents and it goes to 75, are you going to sell it because you have made a good trade or are you going to keep it for the longer term? And I think most important is that you have a good plan and confidence in your plan and then uh, that's that's otherwise you will be very emotional when the stock goes down 10, 10 or 20 percent and you don't know anymore what to do so uh, i think most important is know what you're doing and and know what your plan is going forward and then just wait and have patience hmm. when you sort of mentioned like insiders or, or well basically to me rich people <laughs> buying the stock rich people related to the company buying it um I also have that thought where I'm saying, okay, good enough. If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. But then at the same time, I also sometimes think like, okay, they maybe bought whatever, $200,000 over the last week, over the last month, but maybe their net worth is like 20 or 200 million. That $200,000 doesn't mean anything to them uh, or, or almost anything. So where do you, like, how, how do you make the difference who to follow and who not to follow? Yeah, for sure. I, I make a, a rough, a rough estimate of how well they are doing. So, if if somebody owns ten million shares, uh, and that, that that those ten million shares are worth whatever, I say just say two million, hmm. and, and my guess is that those people are not billionaires or they don't have hundred million, but maybe I don't I don't really care if they have ten or twenty million or thirty million, but it, if it's meaningful to them, if that position is, in my opinion, meaningful to them. Uh, but the stock price is really low and, and it makes sense for, or that it's meaningful for them to see the stock go up then it's uh, then it makes sense for me to get in as well if mm -hmm. i think okay they have maybe a hundred thousand dollar into a company even if it goes up 10 times it will not make a big difference for them then of course yes then then i would also be more cautious mm -hmm. so even though maybe the valuation right now for them is not amazing so if it's only only worth a million for them uh but they own 10% of the company and they have a good project and there's enough potential for this company to ultimately go up 10 times, then you know it's probably going to be important to them to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, so I always look at the insiders and see if they have other jobs, other insider positions. And if those other insider positions seem to be way more important to them than this one, yes, then I fully agree with you. Then maybe this is not their priority and it could take another number of years before they pay some attention to this to this company. So I fully agree. Uh, you have to assess how important it is to the people, to the mm -hmm. insiders. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a it's a good good way to put it. Um, I'd also look at their paycheck whenever I also whenever I interview a CEO, they don't like this question, but I'd ask them like, hey, like you know how how meaningful is this position to you? Is this um you know based on on your paycheck and everything else that you have? Like if it goes down. Are you like, does that change what you have for breakfast? Like, are you going to have to sleep on the couch because your wife is mad at you or something? Or do you not care? And then most of them will say, oh, it's very meaningful. And then I'd say, okay, it's meaningful. You say you have invested $200,000, but your paycheck, annual paycheck is 300. So how, I mean, how meaningful is that considering your other positions and so on and so forth? So that's a, that's a good point when looking at insider buyings. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing. And Sometimes you almost have to accept these high salaries because some of the good promoters or the good CEOs, they, they do pay themselves well and maybe too well. Um, so 
I think even though you may be a bit frustrated about it because you think, hey, why are they giving away half a million dollar a year? Uh, well, there's only two million in the treasury. Um, yeah, it's certainly a concern and something that people think about. But you also want to have people that can make it work for you. And not everybody has that capability. Some some of the really good geos, and they are so honest, and they, they pay themselves a pretty low salary, and they do all the good work, uh, but they cannot get the market excited. Then as an investor, you have a bigger problem, I think. Um, so even though I also feel sometimes like, hmm, this is a pretty hefty salary, you also want to have people that can make it happen uh, rather than people that are really good to the company but and, and, and think they do everything right, but they just don't have the capability to tell a story to the market and get the market excited, raise the money they need. Um, so, yeah, agreed, but be careful not just to focus on the people that are uh, good to you and, and think of every penny but cannot make the stock go up. Right, right, right. That's also a good point. I guess that's what experience teaches you because at the beginning, you're sort of taught to dislike people getting paid more. And so it's so the same with that game. Um, I heard, I don't know who was talking, but if there's like a game, um, like someone gives you a hundred bucks and um, you can only keep it if the person next to you agrees to take whatever you want to give them. So what that means is like you have a hundred bucks and the person sitting next to you, you, you go like, okay, I'm going to give you a dollar. And so you assume, well, he has nothing. If you give them a dollar, they're going to accept it. But the person is going to know that you're going to keep 99. And so they're like, oh, no, I don't want to get a dollar and you keeping all the money, uh, especially if if the person taking the money for the first time is 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 like much wealthier than the other person. Then the other person might feel like, OK, you're wealthy enough already. Why should you keep the 99? And so you're, you're sort of you have this mentality or at least I had it of, okay, they're getting paid too much. They shouldn't be making that much money, but sometimes it just mm-hmm. makes sense. And sometimes you want to keep the good people. So as with everything that we've been talking about these last couple of weeks, the, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. So it makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It's a, uh, it's a difficult game. Sometimes uh, you have to I think, accept that the industry is not always completely fair and that you, that some people, treat themselves very well. Uh, if those people have been successful in the past, then sometimes it's okay to accept it. And uh, But I think the more you know about the company and the more you ex- understand what they do and what they will do in the future, uh, mm. the more confidence you can have in what you what you should do. And uh, mm. yeah, the, I think the more companies you follow, the more knowledge you have about the different ways of doing this business, uh, of running these companies, it makes it also easier to... Uh, to make a decision yourself, like, do, do I want to be a shareholder of this? Not? And, mm-hmm. and to make a plan in the future, like I said before, it's really important to know beforehand what you're going to do. Are you just going to, what if the stock doubles? Are you going to sell it or are you going to keep it? Otherwise, if you have no idea, then at some point you will run, run into that moment like, oh, I should have done this. But um, because these stocks are not going up in one straight line, and if it goes up to 90 cents or whatever and, and it falls back to 50 are you going to feel bad about it or are you going to just accept it because you, all, you anyway planned to hold it for a long time for a certain reason? I think the more you know about the company, but also the more you know about your own plans with your investment, that makes life much easier. True, true. To to go back to that list, though, because I was just reading in some of the stuff on here and I see that Newfound, uh, Newfound Gold Corp hit um, almost 50 grams over 30 meters that's a 150 gram meter hole, uh, almost. Uh, no, it's a wow. <laughs> it's too early in the morning for me. It's 1,500 gram meters. Um, but the stock only went up 23.8 percent. Is it like, well, why doesn't the market like it more? Well, Newfound is of course a very big company already in the market cap. They are an explorer and. I don't have the market cap in front of me right now, but I think it's uh, above a billion. So I think to appreciate 200 million in market value on okay. a drill hole, and everybody knew it's it's a high grade system. But this, I haven't been really looking in detail into this message or this news release. But, but what I've seen is it's pretty continuous. Uh, they had some other hits that were very continuous as well. Um, so it's certainly the market liked it. I think I wouldn't say that 23% is. 
nothing to a big company like this. Mm -hmm. um, they are really early stage still, have no resource, and um, people have to piece it together themselves. Like, hey, is this going to be a good resource? Is it going to be a mine? Is it going to be sold? Mm -hmm. um, like Great Bear was, uh, they, they never did a resource. So you, investors need to be confident. And I think this 20% move is saying that people like this news release and, um, and that it probably opens up you know, size or grade. And um, so I think it's a, it's a pretty big move for a company that size. It, how do you deal with that? That's an interesting part too, because this is a one billion, it's, a, it's an, at a billion dollar market cap right now. It used to be two, I believe, when I was I was looking at it. And, and this is a one billion dollar explorer. So for me, that's almost like a full stop and I'm not even looking at it anymore simply because of how, how big the market cap is while it's really on the on the explorer so you look at the potential but isn't there something that like isn't there a ceiling despite of how much potential there might be for the size of their discovery the size of their ore body isn't there still like a a, a money ceiling like can can this thing really sell for 10 billion dollars mm, i doubt it yeah it's uh i think i think prices have been going up for goods projects uh look at gray bear again i mean um look at voices bay in the, in the 90s and um there are a number of projects really the best of the best that go for two billion three billion um not many i think philo they have a really exceptional discovery uh could they be taken over for five billion or six billion i mean who knows i that's also a level that i am in most cases gone because the upside mm. for example newfound well, I, I, I have difficulty seeing two or three or four billion takeout um, based on what I know about it right now. So um, I would probably not invest in it for that reason. Uh, but that's not always a good reason to sell something. Uh, in most cases, the really exceptional projects just keep giving and keep giving. And um, But I prefer as well, like most speculators, I think, to be a little bit lower in the in the in the market cap range to find opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends a little bit where you are in the in the space and what what kind of investor you are. But for someone like me, it's also um, not the first thing to buy. Right, 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 right. I agree. Just sort of the point that I'm making is, and I'm I'm thinking about um, Newmont's recent takeover bid that didn't go through was seventeen billion dollars, and that's for like a huge gold producer established. They have you know everything on top of it right and um and this is an exploration story so how much does it sell for can it sell for something close to it or half of that and how likely is that so stuff like that is that i'm thinking about and um n not that it has to but it sort of gives you an idea maybe of the of the upside potential because maybe the upside potential in the discovery is not as limited as the upside potential in the price i don't know if i'm making any sense i'm thinking out loud yeah yeah so. Yeah, I, I, I keep on thinking like the best projects, they are probably deserve the valuation. Uh, um, like Rupert is an expensive one, Rupert in Finland. Uh, Great Bear was expensive. Well, expensive is not the right word because maybe probably deserves that valuation. So, but it, it, at the first glance, it looks expensive. Um, for example, Argonaut, before they got their problems with Magino, this, this project in Ontario that they are building, I was thinking they are trading at 800 million or 700 million. They have three or four operating mines. They are cash flowing. Um, they have two new discoveries, I think. Uh, so I was thinking, like, how can a company with three or four operating mines trade below something like Newfound, indeed? But you can see they got into trouble building their mine. In a way, it's also risky to buy these smaller miners uh, because they have an enormous staff. They have operations. If those, those operations are more costly than expected or they have other problems financing. Suddenly, they, they they need way more money than a company like Newfound would need if they get into a bear market, uh, because they need, just need to keep the company alive and just probably lower the spending a bit. And and an operating mine can go broke, really go broke. And some something like Newfound, you know, with with right people investing in it, including Eric Sproth, is not going broke. Mm. So um, so sometimes you could say you could even argue. Buying the, the best discoveries, even at those valuations, is lower risk in a way. But on the other hand, it's uh, exploration. And if, if, if the market really turns, then uh, yeah, there will certainly be some value that uh, some premium that it gets right now that will be gone uh, 
Um, so, yeah, it, it's a difficult one. I, I think those, like the best, the best properties, are most likely to be taken over, and and big companies are willing to pay premiums. And those prices have been going up. I mean, like 10, 20 years ago, three hundred million was a big price. Right now, you see market caps of eight hundred million or a billion dollar for the best discoveries. Um, um, but of course, it makes it difficult for the big companies to take these things over if it's not uh, even even Ikari, Rupert Discovery, um, which is probably the be- one of the best ones, is getting an evaluation. Indeed, like you said, that big companies probably really have to like it and really need to have a long term strategy in that part of the world to spend a billion or two uh, to take a company like that over. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it makes it makes it more difficult indeed to. Uh, get that liquidation event mm-hmm. okay okay then you do have some big names buying into it this is um also still sticking to eric Spratz's name he did quite the effort to get in into it more aggressively i think last year the year before that um so it's a i mean it, it's interesting to see how it develops and, and to follow it especially when they're hitting something like that of course i don't know how close it's to other holes i don't know anything else about the metallurgy and stuff like that but it's it's an interesting point yeah yeah the more the more advanced the project gets the more difficult it gets for people like us because um when you have a, a kind of a greenfields project and suddenly a company hits it's pretty it, it's it's kind of easy to understand it because mm-hmm. there's very limited information and if you can Kind of verify it's not a, a twin hole or anything it's really like a new discovery then everybody has to deal with that limited information and when the more drill holes that go into it the more information will be available and then geologists and people who really can evaluate those drill holes and put it into a model and make their own kind of assessments those mm. people have a big advantage over people like me uh, who are just assessing it at home from their laptops uh, so to speak um, so the more information that's there the more I feel like I'm in a disadvantage and I, I, I do not really have an edge anymore to outperform other investors. And that's mm-hmm. another reason for me not to buy into these things a lot because then you really have to piece together all the different drill holes and get a good view of yeah how much potential is there still? Uh, is this going to work? Is it not too skinny? Uh, mining methods, whatever. Um, so it's, it's it becomes more difficult the more information is out there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, I think way, that's... That- I think that's that about does the um, the list. I'm looking at some of the other news. It's not something that jumps up to me. So, anything else you want to add here? Yeah. So I, I talked about Fosterville South. I've got this image with me uh, about uh, Harfang and also about Prospector. Let me touch on Prospector for a moment. I mean, this this is not like a, a big mover this week, but this is another company that um, was trading at a market cap way higher than the current market cap. Uh, but they they financed at much higher valuations. So these companies, for some reason, went down, probably because last year was a bad year, and the projects didn't deliver, or maybe they were they were not drilling the projects yet. Yet they were still um, uh, permitting the projects. In- interest is vade- fading. The market is bad, and at, at some point, this company traded. Uh, I think even right now, it's cl- trading close to seven and a half million market cap, with five million in the bank. And then you think, okay, who is running this company? And you see Rob Carpenter, who was behind the Kamenak Gold Discovery. You see Greg Roberts, who is also the CEO of Newfound Gold, I believe. Um, you have John Robbins, who was involved with Kamenak and also Great Bear as, as the Discovery Group founder, and also Jim Peterson. So you've got this wonderful team running this company, um, also writing checks for this company, owning a decent chunk of stock. And then this company doesn't trade at cash levels, but has enough cash in the bank that they're not going to dilute like crazy. I think they have the financing still open, but it's a $1 million financing. And they have a couple of pretty interesting gold projects close to Newfound, but also a very interesting nickel project in Ontario. So that those those projects are going to deliver news again. Um, and people will be interested again once they start talking about those programs. Uh, once they start drilling, they will talk about it. They will do more. Promotion. I think companies like this are worth considering uh, at levels like this because you have that sort of safety of a bit of cash in the bank. Everything goes wrong, uh, but you have to, and you have the safety of a good management team that owns stock, that knows how to promote, and that knows how to raise money. And and trading at market cap of seven and a half million 
with probably a couple of really interesting projects. But even without going really deep into the stories, you can already assess like, hey, this should be on my shortlist and I should really evaluate this company and consider buying it. At least that's the way I look at companies. I like these really the companies that were trading way higher um, and still have enough cash in the bank from those times, from those financings to make it work again. And uh, if you have patience with companies like this trading at 17 cents, um, and you can even make a reminder in, in a year from now, I think those companies have a really good shot at trading much higher uh, once the industry improves a little bit and they can get going again on their projects. Mm -hmm. So it, it's important to see that they have enough money that they don't have to raise at these valuations, but can sort of keep their head down and do the work, right? Yeah, and this company is raising a million dollars, so they probably have a reason to raise some money. I don't know if that's to get in a new investor or if that's really to to increase their working capital uh, because of their needs for the for this year. But uh, so sometimes you see them still raise money even though they have already cash in the bank, which is sometimes doubtful. Sometimes they have good reasons for it. It's something you have to assess. But it it often makes sure that that they are not gonna do crazy that dilute the financings. Uh, you cannot completely exclude it. This business is, I've seen companies with six, seven, eight million in the bank trading at $8 million market cap and still doing a finance. So mm -hmm. um, it's not a guarantee, but um, it, it, it's, it helps, especially with, when, I mean, number one is certainly the people. Not, don't just buy cash of companies. So make sure that the people running the company are decent. Mm -hmm. And then if the project's also interesting, then the cash in the bank is a really nice one to have. That sometimes can make the difference between buying it right now or waiting until they finally do a financing. And this one, I think it's the right, the right time to consider it. Mm, right. And you need you need them to have a plan for to, to spend that money, right? You need them to to know what they're going to spend the money on, basically. And uh, and then you need to check if that's enough money to achieve those goals, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah. They have an interesting early stage nickel project in Ontario. And um, Rob, Rob Carpenter, Carpenter is, uh, I think he picked this property and and it's um, something I'm not going to go into details right now why you should consider it for that project but they have a number of interesting projects uh, but I like the nickel one quite a lot um, mm -hmm. so it's it's not a really a prospect generator they, but they have a number of properties and this is not a team that would just play around for, for the purpose of playing around they are looking for a real discovery and then you want to be in a low valuation and that's where we are right, right now. So, And those people also bought stock at way higher levels. I think 70 or 80 cents was their founding round. So, um, yeah, better, it's better to buy 17 cents, uh, to pay 17 cents than 60 cents, for sure. So um, if those people were willing to pay up 60, 70 cents, then it's worth considering buying it at 17. All right, that's about it for this week. Um, next week, I'm in. Oh, no, it's actually uh, the week after that. Next week, I'm doing something else that I'm going to brief you on in, in the weekly um, or in, in the Discord server if you want to come and chat. Um, it, it, the week after that, I'm in, interviewing Keith um, from Monetary Metals about gold and silver. So if you want to send in your questions about that, if you want to ask them why gold is not $10,000 yet, Again, feel free to join the Discord server. But for now, I'll just leave you alone. And I wish you a very happy, healthy, and a successful week.